It's a while since I've done a kit build, so I got this uh, eBay kit, which is a dig digital clock, and uh, it looks quite smart. It's got four very large displays and a temperature function. And um, the displays themselves are quite interesting because, unlike the normal potted display, this one appears to have a clip that holds these the back circuit board on. I'm very tempted, at the risk of breaking this already, I'm very tempted to open that. Although I know that in doing so, I may actually damage them. But that's never stopped me before. Oh, blimey. It's not really wanting to come to bits. Where's a screwdriver? There's a screwdriver. I should actually note which way round this goes. Okay, there's one out. There's the other out. It's actually, hold on, up it comes and focus, it's actually little surface mount LEDs, it's not what I was expecting, I thought it was going to be the little chips inside, uh, just with the wires going onto them, so that's quite rugged. It isn't potted in resin or anything, it's simply got light boxes um, and then it's got this sort of diffused front panel, that was, that's going to be interesting to see what those displays are like, that is something I've not seen before. Very intriguing. Is this going to go back together? Yes, it went back together quite easy. That's interesting. Did I put it the right way around? Possibly. I'll find out later on. So now I'm going to have to focus back down here. I'm just going to use this as a focus card. Give it something to look at so it doesn't randomly focus on the desk like it did in the past. So I've got the digital displays. I've got the some hardware because it comes with a laser cut plastic case which is going to be a treat in itself to put together. It's going to be a treat in itself from previous experience to actually even peel the plastic off, but that is something we shall we'll do later on. It comes with a filter, or as I like the description of this in the instructions, it describes it as digital soft membrane, soft membrane sticky tear attached to the four digital tube, cut off the excess edge display foil better. Excellent, that's very clear. The chips are supplied in standard form. I kind of prefer when chips are supplied in anti-static foam, you know, like, uh, have I got anti-static foam here? Yes, I've got anti-static foam here. He said, causing a huge avalanche of paperwork. I prefer the sort of carbon-loaded anti-static foam because it's the best way to ship integrated circuits without damaging them, without, you know, there's a risk that, you know, electrostatic damage could occur. It's got a very nice circuit board. Um, and one of the best bits of all, is that the, one of the chips is a dedicated time chip that ultimately, in some of the cheaper kits, you just get a single chip and it's a processor and they rely on, you know, it to keep all the timekeeping in the background as well. But that uh, isn't such a great idea usually because the f timing usually drifts. This is a dedicated timing chip and it also comes with a battery holder and it, it, when even when the unit's powered off, it'll run this chip on its own because that is its function. So it'll keep the time. And unfortunately, they didn't provide the battery. But that's no, okay. They provide the battery holder, but not the battery, which is quite a common thing, really. Uh, particularly given the strange behaviour of the postal systems these days regarding any batteries. So let's... Uh, I should mention, uh, if, if you saw this with uh, this little label with assembly guide be, can be found at bigclive.com. That's uh, just because I used that bag to store some of the components momentarily. I don't sell these kits. Uh, I couldn't possibly sell them as cheap as eBay sells them. It comes with a beeper, which is annoying, but um, you know what? Let's just start building it. That's a good idea. This, I didn't know at first what this was. It looks like a diode with no markings, but it, I think it's the temperature sensor, and that complements the LDR, the light-dependent resistor. And really, there's not an awful lot else. There's the crystal, which is good. 32.768 kilohertz, probably. I don't think that's marked. But that's what it will be. Uh, the transistors are probably used to drive the digits. There's four of them. Uh, a couple of side clicky buttons. Small capacitors, two small capacitors, which will be the ones for the uh, crystal to provide a slight load and keep it stable. And then a 100 nano 104, which is a decoupling capacitor. And all the component values are, well, some of the component values anyway, are the resistors are marked, the values are marked on the circuit board. And uh, the other ones, it's all fairly obvious where they go. So, let's start. What do I have first to start with? 
let's put all the resistors in first. That's what I usually do. So there are going to be seven 10K resistors. And there are going to be eight 330 ohm resistors. That does suggest the 330 ohm resistors are limiting the current to the uh, LED display. Now, these are these horrible blue resistors. I, I prefer to actually use a meter to test them because... Uh, so let's uh, do that because it's very hard reading the colours off them because even orange becomes brown when it's got a blue background. But this is hopefully 330. That's good enough for me. So uh, I might actually just note that. 330. And that's going to be, that means these are going to be the 10K. Four band colour code. Let's see. Uh, and these will just be pull up resistors, probably. Yeah, they're the 10K. That is very, because it's all dark colours on a dark background, it's basically brown, black, black, red, by the look of it. Which sounds about right. So let's uh, start with the 330 ohm resistors because they are going along here and they are probably for limiting the current through the LEDs. I use scissors to cut components out like this. I just find it just so much easier. Now let's just cut them all out. They've supplied spare resistors, which is good and also bad. It will be that moment at the end when you're thinking, why do I have spare components? So let's uh, fold these and stuff them in. It's notable the displays go on this side, but all the components go on this side. I'm going to resist the temptation to put all the resistors. No, I'm not going to resist temptation. I'm going to put them all in the right way around. They're not polarized, but you know what? It just looks nicer. Although having said that, you can't even see the colors, but it will give uniformity. It's also notable that the position, the spacing of the leads is so close to the width of the component, the actual resistor, that uh, you just have to bend it with your fingers. Rather than, I'd normally use a tool to actually form these leads and crop them, but, um, well, this is how most people will be doing it anyway. Just fold and stuff in. Eight of them, because uh, ultimately it's going to be the seven segments of the seven segment displays plus the uh, decimal point. I have to remember, it specifically mentioned in the instructions, that one of these displays is mounted upside down deliberately, presumably for the degrees centigrade type display, because this does temperature as well as, uh, as time. So it's fairly straightforward to put together. It's actually a very simple circuit. It's looking good. I like it. I might not like it when it's finished if it doesn't work. But at the moment, it's looking pretty good. I hear my neighbour's out uh, cutting his lawn. He likes uh, to tend his garden every day. He's just a real garden geek. And to hold those resistors in, I'm going to um, put a bit of tape across them. Standard insulation tape. Insulation, Miss Moneypenny. So just slap that across like that. Press it up the other ends. And then just start soldering these. Solder and soldering iron. Once again, I'm using my cheap, generic Yahua soldering iron. It's a soldering station, uh, Yahua 8786D. It combines the soldering iron and the heat pen. I always feel that I have to mention that because someone inevitably asks what soldering iron I'm using. It's a generic iron. I would say that I prefer the sort of chisel tip on it, but they're available readily from eBay. In bulk, cheaply which makes uh, soldering all that much more affordable. So once I've soldered all the leads at one side, I'm going to take that tape off and I'm just going to make sure all the resistors are pressed down properly into position. And if they've uh, lifted at all, I'm going to just gently seat them back down and uh, re-solder them. So I'm just going to crop those leads. And I don't need to crop them right now. Let's, uh, 
pull it off. That's looking pretty good. So let's uh, solder the others. I will crop those leads. Quite small pads. My own preference uh, in making circuit boards is to have quite large pads. Not necessarily terribly productive, but I just like the sort of thick track and pad approach. In this case, they have got quite a lot of tracks to fit in, so it's quite justifiable that they've used smaller pads and tracks. I wonder who designed this kit. I wonder if it's a... It's just a generic, mass-produced, available-from-Chinese-sellers type kit, but I wonder if it was based on someone else's either project or an actual, you know, a kit sold by another company that has been relaunched, shall we say. The bulk of the software will be just refreshing the displays. The displays are multiplexed, only one is lit at a time, so it will be scanning them, so that will be the bulk of what the software is doing. And every so often it will just duck away and it will look at the uh, little 8-pin chip to ask what the time is, and then update the display accordingly. So uh, the next resistors I'm going to put in are going to be the 10K resistors. There appear to be seven of those. Seven 10K resistors. I might even put these in all the way, all the same way around, just for, just because. It kind of does look neater. This is also where I prefer. Uh, these are metal film resistors, the sort of blue ones. Uh, I prefer the carbon film resistors just because they're visually nicer to me. Uh, they're sort of a beigey colour, if you will. I'm not sure what the correct description of that colour is. A sort of creamy beige. And it makes the colour bands very visible on them. They're not quite white. It'd be nice to have white resistors. Then again, maybe they don't do that because white resistors would then quickly show thermal stress and by going brown. So these resistors will be doing things like uh, they'll be in series with the, the light sensor and the temperature sensor to form a resistive divider. They'll also be limiting the current into the uh, transistors. They're little surface mounted type pads there. I wonder what they're for. Programming perhaps? It may be that they have left it, you know, left the programming port open so you can actually flash new software in if you wish. Which would be quite nice. It'd be a nice prototyping uh, arrangement if they did that. Okay, once again, I'm going to put the tape across these. and then solder them. Lead-based solder, of course. It's the only one I recommend for a hobby use. As I've mentioned frequently, it's not actually dangerous in any way. Um, the whole ecological thing about protect the environment is all a bit odd because if you consider how much is actually used in modern electronic products, it's all been a bit blown out of proportion. I wonder how much more hazardous the flux is to the people working with it because it's a much more co co corrosive flux that's used in the uh, in the lead-free stuff to try and make it stick. Lots of weird ideas came out of Europe. I think that's where Ross came from, the reduction of hazardous substances. Yes, lots of standards that were just... It's almost like they have a department that just makes up standards. It's very odd. Mainly populated by people who have no clue about what they're talking about. But let's make a standard anyway. So let's uh, crop these down. And this time I didn't actually check if they're all sitting flat. I've just uh, completely contradicted what I said earlier. Oh well, not to worry. What am I going to put in next? Um, decisions, decisions. This is a nice kit to build. 
It's also cheap enough. It's only about five pounds, or that's probably about six dollars these days, or something like that. Um, it's cheap enough that uh, you can build it and hey, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. It doesn't matter. Cheap kits on eBay are just a great way to learn electronic soldering. You can get them from ninety-nine pence, or sets them for just a few dollars. Uh, not the clocks, but uh, cheap kits in general, little, little LED flashers. For some odd reason, uh, the Chinese call the kits sweets. S-U-I-T-E-S, sweets. This kit uh, came from, where is that? Uh, pretty sure, I think that's part of the avalanche I just caused earlier on. Yes, I think it is. Oh, nope, nope. This one came from... A seller called Seven Color Store. That's the American spelling of color, Seven Color Store. And it was £5.42. You know, it's negligible. For, for what it is, it's negligible. Particularly when it comes to the plastic case. You can't compete with that. I still sell kits on my uh, website, but uh, they're kind of, they look expensive in this day and age now. It's very hard to compete with uh, places like China when they can, well, they've got the components for pennies. And I'm buying my components from, shall we say, more predictable sources like Rapid Electronics or, uh, well, Farnell these days, CPC, are a good option. So the little capacitors I've just soldered in, they act as a slight load for the crystal. The crystal can go in any way around. I'm going to be quite careful with the amount of time I spend soldering the crystal. I'm going to leave it quite long in the lead so I don't stress it because I just don't want to overheat the crystal. I don't think it's that particular, you know, it's not weak in any way. But uh, I'm just uh, wary of the fact that it is a finely precision crystal device. Probably the 32.768 kilohertz because that is a binary uh, division of one hertz, which makes it very easy to uh, process that uh, in circuitry. Oh, look at look how squint that thing is. I didn't do very well there, did I? No, I did not. Shall we try and correct it, or is that just going to be tempting fate? That's fine. It'll probably not work now. Oh, well. A 32.768 kilohertz is very... Crystal is very easy to find because it's just an industry standard. It's used everywhere. C1, 104. This is a... This is a basic a decoupling capacitor. It just basically, I'm guessing in this case, let's look at the schematic. The little decoupling capacitor is, where is it, where is it, where is it, where is it? You guys have probably spotted it already and I'm not seeing it. Oh, there, it's just showing up here on its own. It is just across the power rails and all it does is it just removes any slight transients that might be used you know, it might be the multiplexing of the LEDs causes a slight glitching transient in the power supply. It just prevents that from interfering with the timing of the little uh, the little uh, chip here that processes the time, the real timekeeper. I do like the fact it has that chip. I've mentioned that before, but I'm going to mention it again because it's important. These little one-chip solutions that deal with all the timekeeping and present the time in a nice functional manner, you know, it just, it's a very good solution for timing uh, that takes a lot of worry out of writing the software to try and allow for, um, you know, because every t if you were trying to process the time in the chip, every time you pressed a button and it went and did something, then it, it's forgetting the timing. Um, it's just, it, it's very time consuming to deal with timing. So let's put the chips in now, the, uh, well the sockets for them. They are supplied with sockets, this is good. I tend to supply all my kits with uh, the turned pin sockets, they're better. But these are fine. It's a cheap kit. Just trying to work out the best way to hold this here. I'm not working the best way to hold it here. That'll do. No, it won't. That'll do. I really want to get this up where you can actually see what I'm doing. Not that it really matters too much. I'm going to solder 
a di diagonally opposing pin of the chip and then just make sure it is actually seated in correctly. At that point, it's now going to hold itself in. If it had lifted at one side, because it's easy, particularly when you're new to soldering, then you can then just reflow the solder in that pin as you press it down into it and it should just click down again. Excellent. It solders nicely. Now comes the big socket. Just make sure all the pins are lined up because otherwise it can be quite hard getting into the, the circuit board otherwise. And once again, I'm going to solder a diagonally opposing pin. I can feel the chip rocking quite easily, uh, the socket should I say. So that's one and where it is an advantage just to solder one pin first, uh, each corner or diagonally opposing corners. And then check, did it stay put? Yes, it did. That's good. And then solder the other pins. A bit more smoke than normal because if you just heard a rustling noise, it's because I just poked a plastic bag of the solder iron and now it's making smells of hot plastic. For those of you saying you put the soldering iron so close to your fingers, how don't you burn yourself? Once you've been soldering for a while, the soldering iron will just become a tool in your hand. It just becomes an extension of your body, and it, you just tend you're spatially aware of where that hot tip is. It doesn't really pose that much of a risk to you. Well, unless you touch yourself with it, obviously, and then it hurts. But it's sore enough. Uh, soldering iron burn is pretty sore. And once you've done it, you just know it's going to hurt. Uh, it's one of those things that's like electric shocks. Once you've done it a couple of times, you'll be a bit more weary next time. It's nature. We learn fast. We're humans. It, it doesn't mean I'm not going to burn myself. Occasionally I get so distracted in something that you suddenly hear that noise. That's the first clue you get. You actually hear the hiss of yourself being burnt before you actually feel the sensation because it's so fast. LDR. Now, is this LDR just going to point straight up? I guess it probably is. LDR, light dependent resistor. So it's going in here, or is it actually going to be facing out the front? Hold on, I better read the instructions. Sometimes I do actually read the instructions. Oh, that's not terrible helpful. Uh, force resistant thermistor surrounded an oscillator integrates. It doesn't actually tell you which side that goes. To be honest, I don't think it really matters, probably. It's going to see the ambient light in the room from whichever side. So I'll keep it out the way of the displays by soldering it on here. It's got a wee picture of the thing. Uh, I'm going to put it down flush, but you know what? I may just sit that up a tiny little bit just to take the stress off the leads when I solder it. Yeah, I'll just lift it up just about uh, a tenth of an inch, or roughly 2.54 millimetres, said Clive, giving it somewhat more than roughly. That was quite an accurate interpretation of size. Now I'll just line that up and solder the other connection. Excellent. And now what I'm guessing is a temperature sensor. Oh, it looks like a diode with no markings. I have mentioned that already, but uh, I'll mention it again. It's uh, quite footy to pick up as well. It just looks like a little red glass diode. And again, I will raise this above the circuit board just a little bit. Oh, that is actually quite a footy little thing to actually... I may actually concede that I may have to shape the leads of this slightly without bending it too close to the body because I don't want to stress the glass. So let's uh, fold this in. Actually, I could have put it vertically, couldn't I? Well, that was a bit silly, but not to worry. I've done it this way now. Actually, putting it vertically would have been really sensible, wouldn't it? I'm going to make it vertical. So I'm going to bend this lead back out the way. And just fold the other one down like that. 
so it stands up. That also lets the airflow around it, which is kind of important because it is a thermistor. It's designed to detect the ambient air temperature. I wonder how that will be affected by the fact it's in the vicinity of the processor, which doesn't hopefully get too hot. It might get slightly warm in use, but not that much. Modern processors are very, particularly the speed these ones run at, they're not going to get too hot. This is so close to completion, it's ridiculous. It's a very straightforward kit to build if you've got some soldering experience. If you've not got soldering experience, it might not be the best kit to start with, because it does have very small solder joints, some of them quite close together, but not that bad, actually. Um, if that's the case, then start with something simple like the LED flasher circuits, which are, are really good. Transistors. Let's put the transistors in. I'm going to like, put the pins in and just jiggle it down till they're a nice, a nice height. See, that's the technical term. Jiggle it down till it's a nice height. Just feels a nice, comfortable height without putting too much strain in the leads. The absolute perfectionists will be saying the leads should all have been formed meticulously in a wee jig. But yeah. There is supposed to be another transistor. I'm not seeing that there it is. That would be a disappointing. Without that transistor, one of the displays would not light. That solder iron is so noisy the way it uh, cuts in and out. So with these transistors, I'm going to solder the middle pins first. And then I'm just going to make sure they line up. Uh, I'm going to make sure they're sort of set roughly, sort of straight. Uh, and they've not dropped through the circuit board as I soldered them. And then I'll solder the other pins. Looks pretty good, to be honest. Looks pretty nice. So let's solder those other pins. And really, uh, there's not an awful lot after that. There's the sounder, there's the battery holder, there's the buttons it's, and the power supply connector. It comes with a lead for uh, powering it from a USB power supply, which is just an excellent way of powering little 5-volt things. This is one of these things that would be, in the UK, it would be perfect for powering from a um, Poundland USB power supply, just a generic little 5 volt supply that you could then dedicate to the task of running this clock. Someone sent a, a link to a newspaper article about someone's uh, house that had been burnt down because of a Poundland power supply. A bit suspicious about that. Um, they, it seemed quite well built inside, but if you cover anything with furnishings, it can get quite hot. But the, the way they describe the incident uh, that happened... Um, when they weren't in the room and when their phone wasn't plugged in, by the look of it. Now, this one, uh, the positive connection is generally the side connection, the battery, and the negative connection is the back one in these wee lithium cells. And this is a surface mount component, and that could be quite tricky to solder in, because I'm going to have to push it down while soldering it, because it's got springy leads. Oh, that's not helpful. I may have to do this on the bench. So I'm going to shove that down. It's got aligning pins, which is quite nice. And I'm going to flow that solder in onto that pin. Oh, that went quite well. He said not letting the solder cure at all. Well, let's try that again then. The larger mass joints, if you uh, don't give them time to cool down, they will just uh, fall apart as soon as you let them go. Oh, and now I've put so much solder on that that's not going to line. All right, let's try it. Is this going to work? Have I just completely screwed the kit up at this point? I'm going to blow in this one. Okay, that's pretty good. I wonder what size that looks like it's going to be. Is that going to be a... It's not going to be a 12 mil cell. I wonder what size the of lithium cell it's going to be. It might say in the instructions. I don't have one anyway. So initially it's going to have to go without a lithium cell. <clears throat> Peeper. The sounder. Uh, 
it's got a tab that says positive to that side. So I guess it goes like this. The temptation is to leave this sounder off because it's just going to be horrific. I'll leave the sticky label on it. It does an alarm clock function, this. Plus it also has hourly chime, both of which are terrible things. The circuitry in this, the chip alone, has the scale to be, has the, you know, it's got the facility that you could just use the, the software and the chip to scale it up to a much larger display by uh, modifying the display circuitry, even just running the set of eight display wires plus the four digit wires off, uh, so just 12 wires effectively, um, to a, a external buffer, and then you could drive a much larger display. You know, it, it just leaves options like that. Are these buttons going to go in quite easily? Are they going to latch in? Yes, they are. They're going to, oh, they're kind of, kind of semi going to latch in. Let's uh, solder just one lead at first. Oh, this is where I burn my fingers completely. Am I going to burn my fingers? Is the heat going to shoot right up that and burn my fingers? That's not too bad. Oh, that's all right, actually. That's not too bad, and it's sitting square. Blame, it's almost done. That is just amazingly fast. All I've really got is the power connector and the other button, power connector, and then the displays. It's refreshing being able to actually lean in a wee bit closer to this, do the circuitry, because uh, the iPad used to consume a lot of space. Not 100% decided whether I may end up switching back to the iPad. I've not decided completely yet. I'm using the Moto G to film this at the moment, and it's just not quite perfect. It's like even... Well, I was watching a, a Casey Neistat video recently, and he was saying exactly the same thing about the professional cameras. He says, it's like they get so far with the design that they say, all right, that's enough, and they just don't go the full hog. It's, they leave one function missing. I suppose everybody has a different uh, idea of what they want and the functionality of these things. Right, okay. Very straightforward. Oh, that is definitely going to have to get cropped down to make way for the display. Do you think this is going to work first time? I think there's a good chance at working first time. Hopefully the chips haven't been zapped in transit. That would be annoying. Just the fact they haven't got the proper anti-static protection. Even a... Uh, like Maplin used to ship their chips out for their kits in uh, just styrofoam, polystyrene, but with um, tin foil on top, and it just shunted all the pins together to just protect them. That was an era when uh, things were a bit more sensitive. This is, ow, quite hard to cut. That back pin was much harder. That's the one that's... Uh, Oh, it's the, the springy contact at the side. Right, uh, the displays. This is just shooting together, it's ridiculous. It's a very easy to kit to build. I've said that before, I'll say it again. Um, now, which of these displays? That one shows the dot down there, that one shows the dot up there. So, this one goes like this. Are these going to sit down properly? They do have little spacers. Oh, that's quite neat. That's quite good. It's sitting down. It's not really blocking anything. Okay, so I'll sort of that one. A little death adapter inviting itself into the scene. They do these in a wide variety of colours. Ultimately, now we know what it's just the different LEDs in the bottom of that circuit board. I have just never seen a seven-segment display with that construction. Normally, it is uh, the bare chips with the little wire links on them. And uh, they are generally potted in resin, so the light is actually... The chip is probably encapsulated right into the resin. Or is the resin just being used as a light guide and is the chips external? Uh, most of them are so utterly uh, resined into one solid mass that you can't really open them to explore. I would guess the LEDs are probably embedded in the resin. They become part of the display itself. The Just like basically, uh, it is a shaped LED in that instance. 
loud scrunching noise because I've just made contact with the phone. You might have heard that, I don't know. Maybe that's the downside of the phone being smaller. I can get closer and I'm just going to end up making contact with it every so often. Not as much as I used to do with the iPad. I used to give it regular Glasgow kisses, as they say. I used to stick the heat in it quite a lot because it intruded into the space. Get one pin soldered here. Yep. This isn't going to take too long now. I should get more kits off eBay, shouldn't I? And do assembly. Even some of the simpler kits would make quite interesting videos. Helping the, if you're, you're fairly new to soldering, it would help you get a grasp of what was involved. Other videos that are still in the pipeline was the electron theory video I stalled there with a slight, trying to make magnetism sound easy. It's not. Magnetism is complex. It doesn't help that all the things in the electron theory video, video are not physically visible. Electrons are tiny. They're the building blocks of life right down there so they're minute, they don't have pictures of them. Now this is a display I'm going to have to mount upside down so that they can use the sort of the dot as the degrees centigrade type of thing. The other uh, decimal points in the displays are used to indicate modes apparently. Okay. And fundamentally, once I've soldered these in, I just have to pop the chips in and plug it in and something's going to happen. Or it might not happen. It might be the cataclysmic disaster. And then we'll have to do an autopsy and see where I went wrong. It's a very therapeutic kit. If you're used to building electronic stuff, you'll quite enjoy this. I, there, there's a first problem I just blobbed between two pins. They are quite close together. And uh, cramped over at that side because there are other components in the vicinity. I wonder how many people put the display in upside down, this one, because uh, of the... They just put it in the same way as all the other ones. That could be quite tricky to fix because these are plated through holes. And plated through holes are not easy to desolder. Usually it requires cutting pins off and that would wreck the displays. It's one of those things that could be a kit ruiner. But you know what? If that happens, it happens. Just buy another kit and start again. Another interesting thing about these displays is that because they have the separate circuit board in the back, and it's just held on by a couple of clips. They're kind of wobbly. I'm just noticing that, that, you know, you can actually wobble them like that, even when they're soldered in. Right. OK, let's solder the last display. Exciting. Then I'll put the chips in, plug it into a suitable USB adapter, and we'll see what happens. Someone's asking what I do with all the little bits of solder I end up with, and the answer is that, you know, it has to be very short before I can actually not use it. I can use even down, li literally one centimetre less than half an inch of solder, so it's not that wasteful, uh, just snapping bits off. I prefer to do that than have it attached to the reel. So, I'm going to cheat now. I'm going to use an old tool that I've had for a long time called an IC former, and it squishes all the pins in. I don't know if they, they must still sell these. You basically drop the pin, chip into it and squeeze it. And all it does is it just mashes those pins together. And it makes it easier to put the chip in. So in goes that chip. Make sure the pins are roughly lined to start off with. Squeeze them together in this little tool. It's not essential, but you know, it does make things just that little bit easier. And as a special treat, I'll even put this in the right way round. That would be quite good. That is the kit finished. What's going to happen when I plug it in? Is it going to work? It's time for the moment of truth. 
I'm going to bring the little pink USB adapter. Let's put the power indicator into it as well and see what sort of current it draws. I don't think it's going to be that high. And let's plug it into the display, which has started. Right. 8301. Okay, it says hold both the displays buttons together. Okay, now it's displaying that it wants the time set. Right, that's not terribly helpful. Right, I'm going to have to learn how to set this now. Right, one moment, I'm going to learn how to set this and I'll be back in a moment. Oh dear. How to use the clock as far as I can glean from the instructions, it's all very, very random. To start with, you hold both buttons in at the side, and once you've held them in for five seconds, it goes to 7.59. Then you release them, and approximately five seconds later, it beeps. And once it stops beeping, then you can uh, start setting it. So it's currently displaying the time as indicated by the flashing colons. That is why the uh, decimal point is inverted. It's to give it the double dot. Can I just mention the grey film, the diffusion... The, the oh, It's not diffusion film, it's just contrast uh, improving gel. Uh, it does make a huge difference. Yeah, it makes a massive difference to the clarity. Also note that if you cover the light sensor in this, the display is still lit, but it goes really, really dim. So let's start by resetting this to a known state by holding both the two buttons in and it will go to 759 after a moment. About five seconds, goes to 759, release, a few seconds later, it goes into alarm mode. Uh, and then once alarm mode is stopped, you can then start programming it. <coughs> oh yes. So you press the bottom button here and it cycles through various modes. Temperature. You can calibrate the temperature by pressing the top button there. Uh, and it will, you can then calibrate it to the actual temperature it is in the room. So I'm going to calibrate it to what it is in the room, which is 13 degrees Celsius, which is toasty hot for this place. Cold for most people, but that is the situation. Um, then you can put it to this, which is day and month. So let's uh, put this round to February. And I think it's round about the 19th today. Well, not necessarily when you're watching this, nor will it necessarily be February. But that's how you set the date. The day of the week just appears to be whichever day of the week it is. It seems almost pointless. Uh, today is Sunday. I'm not sure. Some people say Sunday's the start of the week. Some people say it's the end of the week. I would say it's the end of the week. Okay. So there's the time. Uh, to set the time, press the top button and the 8 starts flashing. Now the time is approximately, what is the time here at the moment? The time in here is 1.23 in the afternoon, so 13.23. It does have the fast forward on the numbers if you hold the thing in. Then it goes into the alarm clock mode so I'm not going to set the alarm clock. Oh, I've just set the alarm clock. And then if you press the bottom button, you can toggle the alarm clock on and off with this bottom segment here. This toggles on and off like this. So if you put it off, it's off. Uh, I've not worked out how to get out of this menu now. 8.20. Uh, this is, uh, if you toggle the bottom button, this sets the time that the hourly chime happens. So you actually get uh, the start hour, which is 9, and you can say, I want to start at 9, um, and then I want it to stop at, say, 10 o'clock at night. And then you can also toggle that dot up there, and that toggles the hourly chime on and off. So I'm going to toggle it off, and then hopefully get back out of that. Yes, yes, I managed to get back out of it. So fundamentally, that's how you set this. It's not. It's as clear as mud. You're going to be just driving yourself nuts trying to uh, trying to work this out. So that just leaves us to build the case together. And I'm not sure how this case is going to go together. Um, it's a pile of plasticky bits. Let's uh, so let's try that now. 
The case, right, let's start by ripping all the sort of protective film off, which uh, sometimes, because it's laser cut, sometimes it fuses the film on at the edge and it just doesn't want to come off, which may be the case with this. If this gets too messy, I may just pause momentarily and magically put the case together and then say, here's one I made earlier. Uh, this is not proving terribly easy. Let's see if I can nudge it with a screwdriver. I was just reviewing some of the footage there. I've just discovered a quirk I didn't realise uh, that the software was set up with, that it stopped recording during the first section of the video I made uh, and then restarted uh, because it had reached a particular file length uh, that you're supposed to cap video files at. I should, should have thought that, really. I'm new to using this uh, particular arrangement, and also I was really engrossed in making the kit, so I didn't realise just how time was flying along. That was a half hour, that first section. This is quite a long video. That, I'm going to regret that, haven't I? This is where I scratch the plastic. Yeah, this is actually going to be time-consuming. Tell you what... Um, now, since this is going to take a while to peel the plastic off, the paper off, I'm going to peel all the paper off and then I'm going to come back. Oh, this plastic case, it is going to drive you absolutely nuts, honestly. So there's clues, right? There's a hole in this bit down here that uh, lines up roughly with the transducer, the beeper. It doesn't actually line up with it terribly well. Next clue, uh, the there are two of these side cheeks, but one of them has a sort of oval hole in it, which lines up with the sensor. So we put that roughly about there. Mm -hmm. This is where it starts probably falling to bits. We've got this, which has the hole for the um, power socket. So that goes in there. And at this point, you're going to be like trying to hold lots of bits together. It might be worth actually sticking things like the screws in because the arrangement they've got is that you put a nut into the channel and then this screw goes down into the nut uh, to actually lock the case into that. Yeah, it, it's it's a bit tricky. Next clue. Uh, this bit here has the two holes for the buttons. And it only goes round one way because there's a matching hole to actually uh, go into the little nut holder. And you'll probably get, you know, it will start falling to bits as you're trying to put it together. It's a complete, it's a, like a puzzle in its own right. That leaves this bit to go down there. And then theoretically, the top bit has a little ledge. Now, if you look at the majority of the decimal points at the bottom here, the sort of colons, um, they, this lip should theoretically, I think, go down so that it tilts the clock up the way, if you will. Oh, that's actually gone in, I think. Is everything else lined up? No, nothing else is lining up. So I'm going to now try and put... Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I'm going to try and put this together now. One moment, please. So that's it complete now. And the only problem I had with this was that the end cheek here with the power inlet was just not quite right. It's as if it had been cut incorrectly. And I did try all the other bits round to see if I was, you know, putting it together incorrectly. But no, it had, just was very slightly, you know, offset in the way it went together. And I had to file it to make it fit together, but that was it. Another thing I found out was that whereas I thought this hole didn't line up very well with the sounder, this can flip over either way. And uh, it does, when you flipped it the correct way around, it does line up the sounder. And I've left the sticker on the sounder because it's an annoying thing. Um, other things. When you power this up, it powers up in a very random state. Sometimes it's a, it displays something logical like 702. Other times it'll display a time like 58 hours and 37 minutes. It's just something completely random. And that's because uh, initially I'm guessing that this little clock chip, which I'm pretty sure has memory locations, uh, I'm guessing it's because that little uh, chip is not powering up in a known state because at the moment it's not a backup battery. And it would have been nice if uh, the software had checked for a known value written into the memory of that uh, when it powered up. And if it didn't find it, it would know it was powering up from scratch. And, it, you know, it'd be useful to load default values, but it doesn't. And that means, well, look, it's displaying 95 degrees Celsius. And if I say, OK, let's uh, change that then, Oh, it's gone down to 14 now. Uh, 
And I found in the past that it didn't let you set the temperature prep correctly because if it came up with a really erroneous value, it's only got a small range that'll let you nudge the temperature in. And it wouldn't let you set the correct temperature. It, it had a software error in that regard. And the way around that was to unplug it, leave it to discharge completely, and then plug it in again, then hope it came up with a sort of roughly you know, correct value. And that would even be an issue probably if it had uh, the memory uh, being kept anyway. It's, uh, it's a bit odd. The software is also just a little bit exasperating in the sense that it's got too many functions. It's got the date and it's got the time and the week and the temperature and the chime and stuff like that when, you know, it detracts from the fact that it would make a nice symbol clock otherwise. Um, and trying to program those with two buttons, basically entering sort of menus that are indicated by the different dot sliding, just makes it quite complex. If you lost the instructions, you'd struggle, and I'm guessing that even with the instructions, because they're written in Chinglish, uh, that would also cause, you know, many people problems. And that's slightly, you know, made a little bit trickier by the fact that it goes through the sequence that it displays the time for about 45 seconds, then the temperature, the date, the day of the week for about five seconds each, which means that for 25% of the time it's not displaying the time, which is actually quite annoying uh, for a clock. But um, apart from all these quirks, it would make an interesting platform for writing your own software. It's an STC little pro processor. And it would make an interesting platform because it's got everything there already. It's got the drive circuitry, it's got the displays, it's got the little uh, dedicated clock chip um, and the battery backup for that. You know, it would be a nice platform for writing your own software. Um, what else can I say about this? I like the displays, the fact that they are based, they're not traditional displays with the sort of potted resin. They have that little circuit board with the LEDs in the back. And if you actually tilt this, you can actually see the LEDs it gluing down the side of the displays themselves. So it's quite a neat little kit. And um, it does what it's supposed to do. It does display the time in a manner of speaking. Uh, it's got loads of extra features like temperature and like the uh, light sensing for dipping the display at night. Uh, it's nice to solder together. And it, it's certainly that the cost for that, for the whole module with the displays and the color of your choice and the plastic case, it's exceptional uh, just for a hobby thing, you know, just to actually build this. So, you know, although it's got its quirks, it's actually quite good for what it is. Basically, a clock kit, and it does work quite well for that. So, um, yeah, that's pretty good for... It's fun to solder, and uh, you end up with something quite usable at the end.